interactive discussion program that throws the light of scripture on the biggest issues of our lives. My name is Albert Okran, and it's a joy to welcome you on behalf of Dr. and Mrs. Otable. Today we begin a very interesting journey discussing the African church. And it's my joy to welcome Pastor Mensa Otable to lead the discussion. Pastor Otable, this promises to be huge. Hopefully, we'll see how it goes. Right. Let's welcome my colleagues, Reverend Eric Helmekou of ICGC Open Heavens. Pastor Eric, good to see you. Thank you very much, Reverend Albert. Highly anticipating a big discussion. Yes, yes, yes. And then also, Reverend Priscilla Nana Nketsia, ICGC Eagles Temple. Pastor Priscilla? Thank you, Pastor Albert. Are you ready? I am ready. Wonderful. Doc, in the past few weeks, the strategic importance of the church has been coming up over and over. And in Matthew 16, Christ said, I will build my church. Today, churches are all over the world with footprints, very visible. But many of us don't know about the origin and the journey of the church. Can you walk us through Old Testament to the New Testament and to contemporary times, the journey of the church? Well, the, the idea of a people called out to God uh, has always been God's, in God's plan, right from Genesis. Um, and so... If you look at the idea of God creating a community, a garden, placing a family or a couple there to raise a family is to create a community of people dedicated to to the Lord. And then uh, the fall came. Uh, But the, the effort of creating a community belonging to God has always continued. Uh, the ark of Noah was a kind of a church. It's, it's a community delivered from destruction dedicated to God. And we see this idea uh, through the call of, of uh, Abraham of, to create a family dedicated to God. And then we see that in Israel and, and on and on. Um, of course, the idea didn't always work out perfectly. Israel was supposed to be the church, uh, God's community. Uh, they, they did well sometimes and they didn't do well sometimes. Eventually went into captivity in Babylon and, and, and in Assyria and in the process dispersed. It was very difficult to track them. Uh, then there was the return and eventually we see Christ coming to restart this community of God. And, and so he calls his disciples uh, to become the the group that will be the called out ones who will be God's community. Um, and after Jesus left them, uh, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and inaugurated that. Uh, so we see the work of the God community uh, from the book of uh, Genesis working through uh, to the book of Acts. Uh, that's when we began to see this distinct group of people, not of a particular tribe, not of a particular race, but coming from different places, becoming a community of Christ. And the thing that marked them out is that they acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. In the New Testament, we see primarily two broad communities, uh, the Jewish community of Christ and the Gentile community of Christ. They are one but they, they have different aspects because of the groups they, they are ministering to. The, the early disciples of Jesus were Jews, but after Jesus died, he said that the gospel must go to the rest of the world, and that's where the Gentile churches came through. Eventually, uh, as history progressed, all of these came into culmination uh, when the church eventually got some sort of official approval in the Roman Empire and a formalized church started emerging. There was a formal church uh, before then and the first 300 years of the church. But at this point, it took on a very different character because for the first time, the church, which was always an outsider group, now became part of the larger Roman governance system. And then... Uh, the split of the Roman Empire, the Eastern Church and the Western Church, and, and that went on for a while until 
the 1500s when we had the uh, uh, late 1400s to 1500s, we had the Reformation, uh, the protest, and then the Protestant churches. Uh, and then later we had the evangelical movement uh, led primarily by the Methodist revival of Wesley in, in the United Kingdom. And then in the early 1900s, we had the Pentecostal uh, movement. And uh, in the mid-1900s, around 1950s to 1960s, we had what emerged now to become the charismatic uh, movement. In between, there are different Christian expressions, uh, but this will be a broad picture from Genesis to now. I love this one. Doc, for something so important to God, there must be something he's looking for from the church. What would that be? God's priority right from the the Bible, uh, from Genesis, is to establish his spiritual kingdom in his physical world. God is a spirit, and he created a physical world, uh, which is the seen universe. And we are part of that, and we are on this earth. So God's idea is that as his kingdom is in the spirit, as it is in heaven, so it is here on earth. So he's looking for a people who would interpret his spiritual kingdom in this earth realm. And that that has been the the plan from, from the beginning. It will culminate in a new heaven, in a new earth, where this kingdom will then be manifested physically. Doc, we'd like to look at the story of the African church, Mm -hmm. what its journey has been since its inception, and the notable milestone, if you could share, and how it has influenced the contemporary African church. Uh, Well, if we look out uh, the, the narration I gave from Genesis, then the African church uh, had existed before the missionary effort of the 1700s um, on our continent because Africa was part of all this uh, divine agenda. The early church had a lot of African presence, especially in North Africa, um, and then partly in what is Abyssinia, Ethiopia, that, that whole region prior to the colonial effort. But, uh, I mean, in a formal sense, Christianity as we know it now in Africa came out of the, our encounter with Europe after the gospel had gone to Europe and then through the travels of Europe, the adventures, uh, the gospel came here. So the gospel came here basically as a missionary effort, uh, and it, it didn't only come here as a missionary effort. The gospel goes everywhere as a missionary effort. Uh, we can remember Paul uh, hearing the call from Macedonia, come over to Macedonia uh, to help us. Uh, Macedonia uh, will be in, in part of Europe now, uh, around Greece uh, and, and thereabouts. So they also had a missionary call that to the gospel. That everybody who has had the gospel had had it because God sent somebody. The idea of God sending people to the mission is what brings the gospel to to them. So we got the uh, gospel to us because God sent people to us. And and now he's also sending us to other people. Uh, So the missionary effort was was a major one uh, that uh, established a gospel foothold for, for us in this part of Africa. The first missions, uh, I, I think would be the Anglican or the English. The Catholic actually came in because the Portuguese were Catholic. And then the English came in with the English church. Uh, and, and then the other churches came in. Of course, the Methodist revival also got here. Uh, and, and the Presbyterians through the Reformation, Protestant reform, they came with the other European countries, uh, which came here. Uh, who had become the reformed countries in Europe. And that went on for a while, probably about a hundred or so years, uh, until we started having a new kind of Christian effort here. Uh, for now, we can say that the African church has indigenized largely. Even the missionary churches have indigenized 
uh, in their leadership. The Methodist Church in Ghana is autonomous. Uh, the Presbyterian Church and so on. I mean, they, they, they are a an expression of themselves, uh, not just of a mission uh, that established them. So at this point, I, I would say that the African church is a self-expressing church, um, and it's self-sustained and it is largely self-financed, and uh, it expresses itself uh, independently of other uh, controls from outside. Right. You recently referenced the indigenization of the gospel in Africa as a major development. How much of this indigenization that has taken place is consistent with scripture and which component of it is a transplant of our indigenous culture into our church experience? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question because wherever the gospel goes, uh, it, it comes into contact with the people wherever they are. So one is going to influence the other. Uh, so, in a sense, there is a kind of a symbiotic relationship between the gospel and the culture it is operating in. Part of the culture affects the gospel, and part where the gospel also affects the culture. But the degree and the extent uh, is what is important, because when the, gos- the culture affects the gospel more, then it, it will convert the gospel preached there into uh, a syncretist expression, uh, so so that although it seems like the gospel is being preached, it's actually the cultural expression uh, acquiring new language and new exp- uh, new forms of expression. So you can find things we do in the African church which have no roots in the proclaimed gospel, especially from the New Testament. You you don't find any roots, but you find it's unique to us here in Africa. And it's unique to us because uh, that is what we've been doing. And now we are trying to use the name of Jesus or the medium of the gospel to continue that same belief system without transformation. When that happens, then the gospel is losing its power. Uh, The gospel must affect the culture so that the culture conforms to the ideals of Christ and, and, and what the, he taught the apostles uh, to teach us. So it's a very dangerous line to walk um, when, when you want a people to be themselves. And at the same time, you want them to be of Christ. You see, so how do you become of Christ and still be yourself? That's the delicate balance. And if it's not worked well, uh, then people may seem to be uh, Christians, but they are just uh, the same cultural people uh, who have now found a Christian language uh, for what they do, and, and there will be no transformation. Doc, you said if, if it is worked well, how do we work it well? I think to, to work it well, we have to center everything in the gospel, right. in Christ. You know, once we compromise Christ and we compromise what he taught and what the apostles established as the core gospel of Christ. Once we compromise that and just do what is convenient for us in our culture, uh, then we're on a slippery slope where we may end up doing a lot of things in church which have no foundation in the gospel of Christ. It would seem there's quite a bit of that going on now. In the last I would say in the last 25 years, much of African Christianity is going that way. It's departing from the gospel and becoming more a cultural expression. Okay, let's stay with that. The central theme of this discussion about the African church is a statement you've made a few times in our recent discussions describing the African church as probably the most phenomenal accomplishment or expression in the continent in the last four decades or so. So looking at that point or the things we are celebrating and juxtaposing them against the things we also feel could be better, should there still be something to celebrate? Yes, yes. Because, you know, nothing is perfect in this world. So God uses imperfect people. So, and we cannot say because of the imperfections, we don't see the grace of God. And, and his goodness. So, but the fact that we see the grace of God doesn't mean everything is perfect. It, it's, we need to uh, walk that balance well. So the African church has done phenomenally, and I, I have said it often, 
that as a development model of indigenization and indigenous self-expression from here to the global space, the church has done it more than any other institution on our continent. That's the positive. But there, is, there are worrying areas, and, and it is that increasingly we are seeing people trying to adopt a cultural idiom for their Christianity, which is fine on, it, on the surface, but at a certain point, it, it begins to undermine the authority of the centrality of Christ. Let me give you an example. Uh, uh, something like the pouring of libation. It's, it's, it's at the center of our prayer. And much as I don't see people pouring libation, I see now a lot of people holding olive oil or bottles of oil, and when they are dedicating a land or a property, they pour the oil on the land. It, it, it may seem like a nice thing, but it's a very, very slippery slope because you, you are now finding a cultural idiom which has no New Testament foundation uh, to express this faith. Uh, where, whereas as Christians, um, especially from the evangelical Pentecostal background, we just operate strictly on the authority of the name of Jesus. That when we say the name of Jesus, we don't need any physical mediation for the name of Jesus to be effective. Other Christian denominations apply physical mediations, whether it's holy water or some other symbol. But in evangelical Pentecostal Christianity, we don't have physical mediation for the name of Jesus. So when somebody says in the name of Jesus and he's pouring olive oil, uh, to dedicate a land or do something of that sort. I mean, if he's coming from a Pentecostal evangelical background, they have to really critically examine that practice and find its linkage. And whether we would not get to the point where we would throw the name of Jesus away and just go and do the, the symbolic pouring of the olive oil. So these are some of the things that I feel uh, we should watch out for very carefully. Doc, it would seem that it starts gradually and then it becomes more entrenched and then very soon very difficult to overthrow. Would that be the case? It starts gradually, yes, but it, it's from the, our known. It's something we are comfortable with. It's something we are familiar with. Um, when I was growing up, uh, before somebody would eat, they would take a bit of the food and, and put it on the ground. It's a kind of acknowledging the earth god. Uh, and, and, and it's, 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 it's a meaningful symbolism for people who believe that. But for me as a Christian, the Bible says, I receive my meals with thanksgiving. And my thanksgiving is not mediated by a physical act. It's a verbal thing. So I say, Lord, I thank you for the food that you've set before me. Whereas my ancestors would take part of the food and put it to the ground. Now, I can come to the point where in saying, Lord, I thank you for the food you've given to me, I take part of the food and put it to the ground. At that time, I'm doing two things. I'm doing something that is cultural and something that is New Testament. Now, if I'm not careful, I can get to the point where the New Testament demand on me is gone, and now I'm back to my culture, and, and Christianity has lost its power. So uh, th there are dangers that we need to uh, be mindful of. I don't think it's intentioned that we would uh, take Christ out, but there are things we do that unintentionally can get Christ out of, of the church. This is time with Pastor Otabu, and I know that at a point in this discussion, Many of us were saying guilty as charged. When we come back from this break, we'll find out which other things are we doing with a good heart that with the light of scripture, we could be doing differently. Please don't go away.
Welcome back to Time with Pastor Otabel. As we look at the African church, we are learning, we are becoming better in our understanding of the scriptural position on this subject. We are talking about the African church as a success model. Pastor Priscilla. Yes, Dr. So we want to go back to the success mm-hmm. of the African church and ask how the African church can articulate, appreciate, consolidate the gains we are celebrating especially when the church itself does not seem to understand the importance of this. Well, I mean, that, that tells us of the grace of the Lord, doesn't it? That sometimes God uses you without knowing he's using you. So, uh, and, and so you, you can't even properly explain it because he does it irrespective of you. So part of what has happened in Africa is that God has used people in spite of themselves. If he was just looking at the people, he wouldn't use them. If he was just looking at us getting everything right, he wouldn't have used us. But he has used us in spite of ourselves. But that also should tell you, just because God has used you in spite of yourself, does not mean that you are good by yourself. So then you have to go back, and it takes a lot of humility to acknowledge what God has done through you and what you must do on yourself, what you must work on yourself. So um, I think the African church is, is the demonstration of the grace of God. It's a model, all right. Um, God has used people to break a certain cycle of inferiority on a people. Uh, much of the articulation of the African church. And when I say the African church, I mean the emergent church. And when I say the emergent church, I'm talking about what people call charismatic, which is something I would one day want to properly define. What is a charismatic church? A charismatic church is not just a modern church. There's a clear message that distinguishes the charismatic church from every other church. And we would, we'll touch that one day. But it is that segment that I say has uh, become the model. Uh, and it doesn't mean they are perfect. It's just the grace of God has abounded towards them and they have managed to articulate a message of empowerment and self-actualization that raised a whole generation of people from secondary school to university with strong drive for, uh, for, for personal growth. And, and, and now you see most of them leading almost every aspect of, of our, our national life. I mean, if you talk to most people in leadership in our country, they will point to a church or a fellowship or a Christian group they belong to that helped them form the basis and the mindset that has allowed them to achieve what they've achieved. And that, I think, is one of the greatest things that has happened to our part of the world. So how do you think we can build on this? We have to be aware of it, and then we have to also be aware of its shortcomings so we can correct them and perfect what God is doing with us. That's a great future. There is, there is. I I believe that um, the church is the future. So you said that the African church, sometimes messages are remedial, nomadic, and focused on the felt needs of the people. How can the African church and the pastors position themselves to achieve holistic growth and um, be uh, still relevant in their sermons. I'll still come back to one, what I mean by the African church. Yes. Because I don't mean the general uh, African church. I don't mean the Catholic church. I don't mean uh, much of the uh, Protestant church churches. that came from Europe. I mean the indigenous emergent African church. Yes. That, that's yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. And when I say that their messages are nomadic, uh, a nomad moves from place to place. So one moment they're doing, uh, it's doing deliverance, the next time they are doing prophetic, the next time they're doing something else. You know, they just keep moving and, because they don't have a strong core. So it just keeps track of patterns and follows them. The advantage of that is that it responds quickly. The disadvantage is that it leaves its foundations also very quickly. So as it is responding, it is evacuating from its base. So if it keeps doing that, at a certain point, there will be no base of Christianity left. It's just 
a, a relational institution which does not have Christ as a center. So that's what I mean by, by, by that. And when I say remedial, I, I mean that the church has developed a message that remedies the, the damage in people's lives. I mean, the African society has a, a unique way of damaging people uh, from the institutions, the fears, the taboos, and all kinds of things uh, that you grow up with. Uh, fear of this, fear of that, don't do this, don't do that, shut up, don't talk, you know, all kinds of things that smother personal development. And, and the church has found a way to remedy that to a large extent, even in its perfection, its imperfection. But whilst we are able to do that, we have to come back to what is the foundation of our faith? Who determines the foundation of our faith? And it's not Pastor Otabel or some other pastor. It's Jesus Christ. What did he teach? What did the apostles teach? What, what should be the foundation of Christianity on, relative to this issue or that issue or that issue? We have to wrestle with that and always stay at the foundation. Whilst we are relevantly ministering to people, the foundations must not be departed from. Uh, and, and that, I, I get worried when I see in our effort to remedy the problems of people, we don't now care about the base of, of our Christian faith. So, Doc, does that, um, the foundation that you're talking about, the doctrines, the early doctrines of sanctification, um, uh, holiness and all those things. I mean, they are part, they are of, part it. of it. Yeah. It is who Christ is. Yeah. Who is he to us? How do we live for him? How does he live his life in us? What does his word say about doing this and that? Uh, when it comes to our marriage, how is Christ present in our marriage? When it comes to raising children, how is Christ raising, uh, present in that? I mean, there's a lot of information on how to do all of this, and how to marry, how to raise children. I, I appreciate all the writings. But for me, at the end of the day, if I don't see Christ in there, I, I say, yeah, it's good information, but where is Jesus? Because if he wasn't there, there would be no Christianity. It would be just be self-improvement. Yeah. Uh, but it, it is coming back to that. Yes, so it's holiness, it's sanctification, it's righteousness, is loving our neighbors, is, is treating people well, it's becoming good people, virtuous people. These are all the, 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 the foundations. But that, not just that by itself. It's just making sure that the, the demands for salvation and, and living the saved life are, are emphasized. Yeah, but Doc, don't you think that we should be able to pause from time to time to evaluate what we are doing, what we are teaching. If you pause too well, then you, you <laughs> too long, then you, you get stuck. So it, it's, it's like an army that is marching um, and is having difficulties. Some people fall back, others come to march. Uh, but the army never stops. You know, it's like a football match. A team never stops playing. There will be substitutions, but it, you don't stop playing. So... Uh, we don't stop what we are doing to correct our mistakes. We, we keep marching and correcting our mistakes, uh, but we have to be aware that there are things we must correct. I mean, for me, that is important. And, and we must think deeply about them and we must talk deeply about them and, and we must be humble to, to look at them well and, and see how we can perfect our walk with the Lord in the midst of all the great things that uh, he's doing that we don't lose him. You know, Paul said uh, that after all that he's, he's done, uh, and uh, he doesn't want to be a castaway. You know, and he says, I don't want to have run and run in vain. So it's possible to run and run in vain because that wasn't the track that Christ wanted us to walk in. So let's keep running. We don't stop running, but let's adjust as, as we go along. Doc, let's stay with messaging for a while because I suspect that it's a, it's, a, it's a big issue for many of us pastors. So you, you mentioned about sometimes tending to preach about the felt needs of people. I, I suspect that that would be very popular. Mm -hmm. So 
does a pastor sometimes face pressure between preaching that which will elicit a big applause because the felt needs are spoken to vis-a-vis what you believe in your heart that God has told you to say that may not necessarily be too popular? Uh, yeah, I don't even think the applause may be the motivation. You know, James says, uh, if you have faith, show by your works. So he says, you can't tell somebody, be well, and not do something for him to be well. So here is preaching, telling people, be well. Is that sound? Yes. Is that what Christ wants us to preach for people to be well? Yes. But James says, in addition to saying, be well, do something for the person to be well. So there is always a balance between the message and how the message is achieving a result in the life of the people that makes the person's life well. So if, for example, I have a church and my church is full of secondary school kids or university kids, and I know that university kids uh, want to pass their exam and they want to excel, um, and, and I teach them how to plan and how to set priorities and how to manage their time and all of that and how to set goals. I'm meeting their felt needs. And that is great. But whilst I'm doing that, they don't have to see setting goals and achieving their goals and, and all of that as the most, the only thing about their Christian life. I also have to teach them about who Jesus is, what he says, what we must do, the foundational doctrines of Christ. So those two must go hand in hand. Whilst I'm giving the people practical knowledge to live their lives, I'm also making sure that they are properly centered in Christ Jesus. So um, the, the question is, how do you titrate that? <laughs> you <know? laughs> how do you titrate uh, between... Uh, doing this and that. I mean, for me as a pastor, I have a schedule I work on. So I go through that schedule uh, routinely. So there will come a time when I teach strict foundational doctrines. Nothing motivational, just how to study the Bible, how to interpret the Bible, who are angels, you know, things like that. Just laying down doctrine. You know, it has nothing to do with you passing your exam. Then there will come another season where I'm teaching motivational messages on how to live your life and how to overcome and, and all of that. So you, you titrate it. It's a kind of titration. One point, you are stabilizing them in their faith. Another point, you are helping them to manage their lives. So that, that is uh, what I'm saying. But pa- sometimes we get so uh, caught on the practical helping people with their message and, and lose track of their faith in Christ. Um, and and that's the balance we need. So we need we need a titration yeah. formula, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Look, so what are the percentages? That balance. Percentage, yeah. I I I generally, I mean, if you if you just track the cycle of my preaching, um, normally by the beginning of the year, I would do something very inspirational, motivational, because that's what people need. They started the year. I've, you know, they, they, they need to know how to plan and, how, and know that they will make it and things will be well. And I'll teach you those practical things. Somewhere as we are getting to Easter, I started easing off into my hardcore Christian messages. And, and, and then right through to Easter till after Easter to after Pentecost, you know. So, uh, it's, so in a year, I would have about two sessions where I am inspiring people. Uh, and then two sessions where I'm, I'm teaching foundational doctrine. Sounds like something that is very planned. Would, would you recommend, I know in certain denominations, they have an almanac or a guide, something that is structured and we are, ex- or leaders are expected to preach with it. Would you recommend that kind of regimen? Uh, it, it, it has its value. Um, uh, well, there's a liturgical calendar. Uh, or some almanac of, of a sort. Um, it has its value. I try to follow the Christian calendar in my preaching. So uh, usually the major Christian celebrations, I will preach around the theme. When it's Christmas, 
I'll do something about Christ, the incarnation, the virgin birth, and what it means. When it's getting to Easter, I'll teach. When it's getting to Pentecost, I'll teach about the Holy Spirit. So I try to follow the Christian calendar to just get these uh, foundations knocked in constantly. Um, And then I teach other things. So I think each pastor should have a calendar they, they work with. I work with planning. I work with planning. So the Spirit helps me to plan, and, and I follow the plan. So, uh, because you can forget uh, what you're doing if, if you don't have a clear plan that you are following. This is time with Pastor Otabu, and am I not enjoying? Are we not learning, Pastor Priscilla? This is just something very special. <laughs> very helpful. Heavy, heavy meat. Pastor, Pastor, Pastor Eric, <laughs> I, I suspect you need to do some reviews of what I'm you've been telling you so far. <laughs> We'll go for another brief break. When we come back, we'll bring out another huge subject under the African church for instruction, for learning, and for self-improvement as we seek to know the Lord and walk with him in the light of his word. Please don't go away. Welcome back to Time with Pastor Otable. And if you haven't called somebody you love to join this discussion, you are doing them a great disservice. Call somebody, WhatsApp them, get them to be part of it. And you can also send your questions for Pastor Otable's attention for subsequent editions as you look at the African church. Pastor Otable, the church has been portrayed in two financial extremes. First, with a reference to as poor as a church mouse. And on another hand, as very materialistic and overemphasizing a prosperity gospel. What is the scriptural position on the church and money? As I do with everything, I try to look at the full uh, extent of scripture from the beginning through to the New Testament and to now. So um, I'll look at God and money and from Genesis to right through the Old Testament. I, I think that um, God himself appreciates the wealth he put into the world. So he himself says that the silver is his and the gold is his. Interestingly, in the Garden of Eden, uh, in the description of the four rivers that flow through uh, Eden and, and going, one of them going to the land of Havilah. And the Bible talks about there is much gold there and the gold there is good. So even in the, in the context of Eden, God's ideal community, uh, there is mention of gold and good gold. So that's money. That's wealth. Uh, if you look at the uh, demands God made for the construction of the Tabernacle, which is a temporary moving uh, meeting place for Israel in the desert. There is a lot of gold. Quite a lot of the materials are made of gold. In the building of the temple, there is mention of gold. So God is not averse to the use of gold and silver. Today we'll call it wealth. Um, In the work that he gives to us, and in the work of his house. Neither is God averse to people being wealthy. I mean, we see it right in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, part of the blessings you find in the Old Testament is that the the Old Testament blessings always had real estate in it in in terms of land. And then it, it usually has long life. And then it has prosperity. Uh, so you, you find that God's scheme of making people live on this earth in a good way includes taking them out of scarcity and poverty. So, so that, that is established. Jesus Christ brought us a certain duality of relationship with man. 
and and uh, from his own life and from his teaching, he he told us not to prioritize money, and 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 everything about Jesus tells us that although money is good, it should never become our heart desire. He went ahead to say that it actually could become a conflict in our relationship with God because we can't serve God and money at the same time. One has to be a servant to us and the other has to be a Lord to us. So Jesus says, don't let money be your Lord. Let God be your Lord. But that doesn't mean money has no relationship. It must be your servant. Instead of money is your Lord and uh, for, for some bizarre reason, God is your servant. Uh, God is our Lord and money is our servant. So for me, that is the balance we, we have to tread um, in, in our understanding of wealth, whether it's institutional wealth for a church as a body or at the personal level for individuals in the Christian community who work hard, who labor hard. Uh, I believe there is a balance. And no matter how well uh, you are blessed, James says that we should not favor the wealthy above the poor. And these are Christ-centered messages. These are very important things. So we don't build a church where we give special treatment to people because they are wealthy to the disadvantage of the poor. And and this is how we create the balance uh, in, in the way we manage these two extremes. There seems to be a tendency to misinterpret scriptures that have any bearing on money. And so many people will say it's difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom and it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Well, Jesus taught it, but then right after that, he says, with God, all things are possible. <laughs> so, <laughs> so although it's difficult and it says it's difficult for those who trust in riches, to enter the kingdom of God. And it's still God and mammon thing. If you trust in riches, then mammon is your Lord. And God is only left with a servant rate. And if God, mammon is your Lord, then you can't enter the kingdom of heaven when you think money is more important than God. Uh, but he says that although it's difficult, it's still possible. Yeah, and, and that means that it's possible for people to have a change of values where instead of mammon being their Lord, God is their Lord, and Mammon is their servant. Then they can enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> but m- money seems to be a very touchy subject in Christian circles. And people subject fundraising methods to intense scrutiny. What does the church do? The church is supposed to be self-financing. How do we carry out our responsibility <laughs> without being labeled or touched as money conscious? I think we should find a whole program to deal with the church and money and properly work our way through. Because sometimes doing this piecemeal answers doesn't give us the proper context to answer the questions. Um, So why why are people touchy about money? Because money is touchy. <laughs> you know, somebody says money is blood. Money is touchy. You know, it's people's sweat. It's people's hard work. It is what um, is what people live on. Uh, without it, life becomes almost useless. People who have it live better life. People who don't have it don't live a good life. Um, and it's not given freely to people. It is given to people as a result of hard work. So they, they work so hard to get this commodity. So parting with it is also very hard. If it comes hard, it goes hard. And I think it's also important for, for the church then to also know how hard it is and how difficult it is for people to get money. And, and so we don't trivialize the process of getting money from them. Uh, we, we have to value the effort they put in to get it. And, and yes, it doesn't all belong to them because their lives doesn't belong to them, it belongs to God, but it must not be seen that we are just trivializing their effort. And, and I think when people feel that way, they just feel you are, you are insulting them and, and not treating them fairly. So uh, that, that's the balance. But should, does a church need money? Yes. How does a church make its money? From its members. 
from its people. Why do the church members give? Because they are grateful to God for blessing them and, and prospering them. And they feel that they must support uh, the work which has so blessed them so it can bless other people. And, and it is just a sense of gratitude that makes people give, give in, the, in the church. I think the point you made is very critical, that we should appreciate their hard work and not trivialize you know, the giving process. Yes, uh, we, we, we have to. We have to. Sometimes uh, people hold on to their money very hard. But, you know, like everything else, you have to also know how to release before you receive. I mean, it's, it's except a grain of wheat falls to the ground, it abides alone. I mean, can you imagine if you have only one corn left and you don't want to release it because I like this corn, it's my last corn. But it's going to be your last corn forever until you plant it. Then hopefully the next harvest season, you get 10 years of corn. And, and now you have more luxury with your corn and how to use it. So that's very important. So, I mean, if somebody has his last corn and uh, he has to release it, 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 it takes a lot of faith uh, for, for them to do that. And you have to, we have to understand the dilemmas people go through financially uh, and we, we should understand them and not just say, oh, we understand you, so don't ever give. We understand you, but this is the principle and this is how it works and take time to teach people how good Christian stewardship with the resources that God has given to them. Well, the last question on money today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the overwhelming needs of the church, should the church depend on offerings, tithes, and donations, or should we look at other avenues of making money? And that's a touchy one. I mean, primarily, that is scripturally what we are given. You know, in the Old Testament, that's how the temple was taken care of. In the early church, that is how uh, the work of God was taken care of. Uh, in church history, that is how uh, the work of God is taken care of. However, uh, Jesus also taught us as good stewards that the money that comes into our hands, if he gives us talent in the parable of the talents and the minas, you have to do something with it. So a church can go ahead to say, instead of just spending everything that comes, we are going to find ways to either place some of these in investments, uh, very, very good, not get rich quick yeah. investments, but <laughs> sensible investments to earn some uh, gain on, on this so that we, we may better use of, of the monies that God has given to us. If the church wants to go ahead and risk the monies of the church, then it has to seriously consider what it is doing. Um, as much as possible, the church money should not be invested in a way that risks the, the, the resource that has been given. So what about a church going to commercial ventures? That's, that's what I mean. Commercial ventures are very risky. Yeah. They can do well or not do well. Um, so... I mean, it has to be thoughtfully. I, I would want to look at this in a broader Understood. sense yeah. because there are nuances. There are shady areas that we have to bring out properly so we can clarify the issues. But it's, it's possible, but it, it also has pitfalls that we have to watch. Doc, let's take a few moments to go through some of the questions that our viewers are bringing to you. Let me start with Jonathan Africa Halley, who's asking, how do we decouple our culture from the gospel to other worlds? We can't. Because we are cultural beings. So no, no matter how decoupled I am, I'm still an African. And there is a part of my expression of the gospel that is a result of how God has met me in my Africanness. And so when I go to preach that message, will come through. Remember the woman of Samaria who went to her village and says, come and meet a man who told me mm. all that I've ever done. He, he didn't say that this man would tell you. He says he told me. In other words, her understanding of the message is how it has applied to her. The blind man uh, who was asked whether Jesus was a false prophet or not, he says, well, one thing I can say, <laughs> you know, 
I didn't used to see, now I can see. In other words, we always express the gospel message from how it has touched us, yeah. how God has met us, how God has ministered to us. So when I go to preach, that is what I'm giving, such as I have, I give. If somebody is uh, from a different culture, that's how they're going to preach it. Um, so it's it's very difficult to really remove yourself from your message. Otherwise, then it has no authenticity. Doc, is there, is there a similar correlation between the founder's personal philosophy and how it influences the message of the denomination? Is there a kind of correlation there? Yes, I mean, Christianity has always been shaped by individuals. I mean, uh, for us Protestants, uh, Martin Luther and his journey with God influences Protestantism. Calvin and his journey with God, Zwingli and his journey with God, Wesley and his journey with God. I mean, these are individuals journeying with God, having experiences and sharing those experiences with all of us. So what happened to them, like the woman of Samaria, come meet a man who told me all that I've ever done. Then the whole village comes. So these people have individual experiences and share them with us. And in that, we find an aspect of God's relationship that we didn't know or didn't have. And it enriches our lives. It doesn't mean that's all there is to share. Uh, but it, it gives us that aspect. So Christianity has benefited throughout the years uh, from individuals um, who have had uh, a revelation like uh, Brother Lawson of uh, Divine Healers Church who had a revelation of the name of Jesus and, and, and just believed that by the name of Jesus people could be healed. Doesn't mean everything about him is perfect. No. Doesn't mean you should take everything he says. No. It just means He's saying like the woman of Samaria, can meet a man who told me everything that I've ever done. So I have an experience with God and I'm sharing. You study the scriptures to see how much of this experience is valid within the context of the New Testament and how much of it you want to keep away and how much you want to add to your own Christian life. I was patiently waiting for us for you to tell us your own experience and how it shaped your ministry. I mean, different things have shaped my experience. Uh, I'll have another time to talk about it. Uh, but my understanding of God, uh, especially when it comes to the African world, the African persona and selfhood, uh, is driven by my own journey of trying to answer questions about who I am uh, from this group of people that the whole world seems to look down on, this group of people who don't seem to be able to achieve much, uh, this group of people who, for some reason, struggle just to make life possible. And why is it so? Is it God? Uh, is it us? Is it our society? Is it history? Is it geography? It is this discovery or this journey that has enriched my own spiritual experience. So I can tell people, come meet a man who has told me all that I've ever done and, and introduce you to a God who speaks to the African in a way that helps us to self-actualize and, and Christianity as the most potent tool for African self-expression uh, because I've experienced it. Absolutely priceless. There's definitely the appetite, and we'll come back next week as we continue this discussion. Thank you, Pastor Eric, for your contribution. Yeah, thank you very much, Pastor Albert. Thank you, Pastor Priscilla. Thank you. And thank you to you out there for joining us for this very, very insightful discussion. Doc, take us home with your closing thoughts and with a prayer. Well, you know, the, the, the church is God's answer. So we trust God that he, his grace will be sufficient for the African church, that he will lead us, and uh, he will help us to fix our problems, and uh, we don't despair. In the midst of all our difficulty, God is a good God, and he'll help us through. So I pray for you, my friends, and I pray for each one of you. Uh, if you're a Christian and you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are part of this magnificent community that Christ has raised 
to serve the world. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray that you invite him into your heart and make you part of this awesome community that he's building to solve the problems of the world. May the Lord strengthen you. May the Lord guide you. May the Lord use you phenomenally wherever you are to do his